Bedouin Press presents 7 and 7, a globe-hopping memoir of disaster and discovery. Written by Sven Michael Davison and performed by Sven Michael Davison. Continent 7, Australia, September 14th through 28th, 2008. Sydney Harbour Bridge spans a stretch of water like the iron sail of a colossal spinosaurus. The broken eggs of this ancient reptile lie 1,500 feet across the sea, creating the famous Opera House. Like a gnat, I stood on an iron walkway twice the width of a desk, absorbing a sumptuous view. I was tethered to a steel cable, dressed in a jumpsuit so nothing could fall out of my pockets onto the busy motorway below. My companions and I were on our way to the 463-foot summit. I took a moment to scan the waterfront. I longed for a camera. I turned to my fiancée, Janine. Does the height bother you? Surprisingly, no, Janine answered. I glanced at Steve, my friend since preschool. The steel arch is so wide, you don't even notice the height, Steve added. He was five foot eight with olive skin and usually wore a beard and a mustache. When he wasn't in a jumpsuit, he looked extremely fit with his washboard stomach and no fat on his body. Yet he ate junk food like a teenager and plenty of candy to boot. He had a metabolism that wouldn't quit. He and I had planned this trip before I started dating Janine. Luckily for me, they both got along and the idea of the three of us taking this journey together coalesced with ease. We trekked the arc of the bridge in a group with nine others. We summited, crossed the opposite side, and came back down again. The Sydney Bridge tour was well worth the cost for the unique experience. A night tour was offered for an additional fee, and I pondered taking that one as well, but we had a robust itinerary. At the tender young age of eight, my mother had taken me to see Walkabout, a film concerning an Aborigine boy meeting up with two abandoned city kids in the middle of the outback. As I grew older, I fantasized about my own Walkabout, eating witchetty grubs and absorbing the Aboriginal creation tale at the foot of Uluru, under the cloak of the Milky Way. I had tried to book such a trip nine months in advance, but I discovered I needed 14 months' notice. Since the demands of my job held me to a strict window, I had to seek other adventures in the land down under. Finch Hatton Gorge seemed to fit the bill. It is a mountainous area just north of Mackay, near the east coast of the continent, close to the southern tip of the Great Barrier Reef. After all the unique species I had seen in Antarctica, I had a burning desire to photograph some of Australia's unique fauna, and this area was famous for platypus sightings. In my search, I came across the platypus bush camp, a rustic site where the rooms were built on stilts because the river tended to flood its banks during the wet season. The website had a video of a platypus swimming right next to the accommodations. I booked us for two nights. We landed at the Mackay Airport on a late September afternoon after three days spent in Sydney. The two-hour journey to the bush camp took us off the main highway, down some deserted two-lane roads, past a filling station standing in red earth that also housed an eatery called Pinnacle Pies, and finally onto a dirt side road. The sun was setting on the mountain horizon when we spotted a large wooden sign marking the entrance to the camp. We parked in an unpaved lot under a canopy of trees. A meandering earth path led into the forest, and we walked single file to where the signs indicated the camp would be. The air was crisp and cool, though it had been blazing hot when we had left McKay's airport. The surrounding forest was surprisingly quiet. We passed an open hut on stilts, constructed of logs the size of telephone poles. The hut was elevated about six feet off the mulched earth. A short wooden stair led up to the floor of the hut. A three-foot wall encircled the sleeping area, but between the roof and the low wall, the hut was completely open. The roof was supported at each corner by the same post that held up the entire structure. The idea of sleeping this close to nature enthralled me. Those are cool. In more ways than one, Janine rubbed the goosebumps on her arms. A shriveled up man with a wiry white beard, baggy jeans, yellow checkered flanneled shirt, and a crumpled hat shuffled out to meet us. He was about five foot four and didn't look a pound over 95. You could smell the cigarette smoke on him from six feet away. This was Waza, our host. Hi, I'm Sven Davison. I have a reservation for three for tonight and tomorrow. Yeah, been expecting ya. Waza's accent was thick with a heavy mumble, like gravel tumbling over rock. It took a great deal of concentration to understand his speech. He extended his hand, 
which shook harshly. You can have cabin too, back up the path that way. We all turned to eye the twelve by twelve wooden box on stilts, nestled in the trees halfway between the bathrooms and Waza's place. Waza lived in a stilt hut too, only his was twelve feet off the ground and thirty feet square, with a small covered rooftop balcony. His home had the same open air design as the guest houses, but thick green tarps covered every opening. A satellite dish sat next to a water tower, built a few feet from his front stairs. The natural light faded as Waza gave us a quick tour of the common areas built at the foot of his abode. A ten-foot-wide river meandered next to his home and the outdoor kitchen. On the side of the kitchen facing the river was an open wooden workbench that served as a counter. Also near the kitchen and the river stood a gas barbecue. I focused on the river and turned to Waza excitedly. What's a good time to see your resident platypus? She's dead. Died two years ago. Buried her myself. Tears welled in Waza's eyes. I felt like a child who had just been told Santa had never existed. I felt for Waza too. But we do get others around here from time to time, Waza was quick to add. With my hopes renewed, Waza continued the tour. The entire patio was sheltered by a rough hewn log frame which supported sheets of corrugated aluminum. There were no doors or windows, but there was a low stone barrier on two sides, presumably constructed to keep floodwaters from washing away the kitchen during the wet season. Two huge propane tanks stood behind each wall. A fire pit sat beyond the south side of the kitchen, surrounded by a couple of park benches and a few director's chairs. Everything in the common areas was self-serve, and you had to provide your own food. Waza also showed us a sturdy wooden frame attached between two support posts, which held five small plastic garbage cans, each painted in a different color. Waza explained their use. Pick your color and store your food. Critters come down all the time, but they can't get in the cans. We thanked him and went to settle into our stilt hut. When we hoisted our bags up the skinny wooden stairs, we found a bare wooden floor and a queen-sized naked futon with a mosquito net tied above it. There were a few pillows and a cot for a third person in our party. I'll go talk to Waza about bedding, I said, and shot down the stairs. Bring your own food and bedding, he answered when I found him. So no bedding at all? None for you. It was pretty much dark when I got back to our hut. Steve and Janine were settling in using the flashlights we had packed. There was no electricity in the camp except in Waza's house, where it came from a gas generator. I cleared my throat and informed my companions of the situation. He doesn't have any bedding, so do we check out and find a different place? Steve shrugged. I didn't see anything else around here. I suppose we could make our way back to the main highway. I wouldn't have minded bringing my own gear if I had known, Janine added. Yeah, I don't recall anything being on the website, and I booked the room via answering machine. If it had been just me, I would have stayed, but I was feeling guilty and responsible for Janine and Steve's comfort since this had been my booking. If we all share the bed and wear all our cold weather gear, I think we'll be warm enough. Steve and Janine stared back at me in silence. Janine spoke first. Okay, we can give it a shot. She was being extremely accommodating. This was my second strike on the trip. I had also booked our previous accommodation in Sydney at the Hotel O'Malley, a fancy name for a boarding house where we were all crammed into a shoebox-sized room with two twin beds and a cot. With the cot, there had been no space to walk in the tiny room. In addition to this small inconvenience, we had to use the communal bathroom down the hall. Yet all of these issues were tolerable. What was intolerable was the location of our room directly above the hotel's main source of revenue, an Irish pub. After a sleepless red-eye from Los Angeles to Sydney, we had walked the city all day and were in desperate need of sleep. Between 1.30 and 2.30 in the morning, the patrons of the bar gave us an extended rendition of American Pie. There is a special level in hell where sinners are damned to sing the last verse of that song until the breaking of the world. The torture is equal to those souls slaving on the level above because they are not allowed to plug their ears. At the Platypus Bush Camp, we were again facing another uncomfortable night. I knew Janine and I were thinking the same thing. We're not college students anymore. We're both in our late 30s with executive jobs. We earned the right to go a little upscale in our accommodations. I expressed my feelings to Janine, and she smiled. The rest of the trip isn't like this, is it? No, I promise this is the last of the adventurous places we'll be staying. In that case, I can handle it. We drove back on the main road to Pinnacle Pies, the only place we had seen to eat within 20 miles. 
We had some trepidation about eating at a gas station and convenience store. However, the pies were quite tasty. After dinner, we purchased beans, bread, peanut butter, and some water for our breakfast. Steve, a connoisseur of chocolate and frozen snack food, found three types of candy bar he had never seen before, which he bought for future tasting. When we returned to the bush camp, it was coal mine black outside. As we navigated the trail under the forest canopy, a faint glow could be seen high in the trees, the light of Waza's TV flashing behind the thick rain tarps covering his windows. We stopped to use the toilets on our way to our hut. With our teeth brushed and our hands washed, we suited up for bed. I put on a t-shirt, long sleeve shirt, and jacket. Janine layered up with everything in her backpack, including a ski cap. Steve put on a hoodie and a jacket. We all lay down on the bare mattress on our backs, stiff as cordwood. We dropped the mosquito net, partially because we didn't know if Australia bred a critter that liked to bite in the cold, and partially because it gave the illusion of insulated warmth. The temperature was in the low 50s and dropping into the 40s. Janine's teeth chattered, and I pulled her close to me in order to keep her warm. I longed for my Antarctica parka. The three of us spent the entire night huddled together as one shivering mass. I'm not sure if I actually got any sleep. About an hour before dawn, I decided a walk was preferable to lying awake shivering. I needed to get my blood flowing to rekindle my inner furnace and push out the chill that had hooked into my bones. I paced around the camp with my flashlight and then sat on some rocks overlooking the stream in hopes I might glimpse a platypus or albino crocodile. When the sky began to ripen from black to orange, I tiptoed back into the cabin to grab my camera and photograph Janine and Steve asleep in our communal bed. The sound of my shudder made Steve open his eyes. He looked at me with exhausted misery, then closed his lids. There was no way we'd be sleeping here again tonight. I wandered back to the dining room and opened our bin. My breakfast consisted of a peanut butter sandwich and bottled water. Just as the sun stretched its rays into our mountain valley, Waza awoke with a fit of smoker's cough. The sound was deep, phlegmy, and racked with pain. Once it subsided, I smelled burning tobacco. Janine and Steve got up and joined me at the river. Janine boiled some water in Waza's kitchen and made a cup of instant coffee. Did you sleep last night? I asked. I don't think so, she replied. I might have gotten an hour, hard to say, Steve added. An Australian woman emerged from the woods wearing sweatpants and a hoodie. She looked a lot like Janice Joplin. We introduced ourselves and she joined our conversation. Her name was Maggie. What did you do for bedding last night? I asked. I brought a sleeping bag, Maggie replied. Waza lost a lot in the floods back in January. She waved to the little river, gurgling ten feet from the kitchen. We had to make a lot of repairs to this place. He built all this himself. I looked up at the big, varnished hut clad in rain tarps and thought of that frail little man who could barely breathe. How did he have the strength to do any manual labor around this place? I can lend you some sleeping bags if you need. I've got plenty in my car. I quickly glanced at Janine and Steve. I was not about to commit us to another night, given how miserable the last few had been. Janine made the decision for us. Are you sure? Absolutely, dear. How long are you here for? We're leaving tomorrow, Steve replied. Then it's really no trouble at all. Steve and I joined Maggie as she made her way through the camp to the parking lot. Maggie's hatchback looked as if it had seen thousands of outback miles. It was caked in red dirt and filled with camping supplies. Where's Waza's accent from, I asked. It's much thicker than others I've heard. He's a bushman. He's lived in the bush most of his life. He learned to speak there. Think of them like your American cowboys. With three down bags in our hut, we were fixed to stay one more night. By the time we had finished unfurling our beds and organizing our room, we had gotten our second wind. We drove out to go hiking in Finch Hatton Gorge. On our way out, Steve spotted a wooden sign at the side of the road. Forest flying! Steve announced as he looked up the website on his phone. It's a zipline course through a fruit bat colony. He looked at us with excitement. Want to do it tomorrow morning before we head out? I looked at Janine to see her reaction. She nodded. Sounds like fun. On our hike, we saw goannas, big three-foot-long black and yellow striped lizards, as well as a few kookaburras. But as the day marched on, I couldn't quell my burning desire to find a platypus. I poured through our guidebook and some local literature. In both sources, we were told to hang out by a certain river at sunset, and the shy little marsupials would come out to feed. We drove out to a nature preserve and parked. After getting out, we spotted another kookaburra, 
and headed over to a bridge that overlooked a river. It was an hour before sunset. There were plenty of turtles in the still water, but no sign of a platypus. Steve broke out his remaining chocolate bars. He had already polished one off. Guys want to try one of these? Sure, Janine bit off a piece. I passed. I have never been a fan of chocolate. The sun dropped below the mountains and the sky grew dim. Just as I was thinking of packing it in, we saw a little furry animal about the size of a house cat wriggling in the water. Is that it? Steve asked, squinting in the dim light. I looked at the animal through my 400 millimeter lens. It rolled and played like an otter, only it had a wide, fuzzy duckbill on its face. Yup, that's it! I replied as I snapped several shots. Steve took photos as well. He's so playful and cute. After our encounter, we had a quick meal and hung out around a campfire with Waza and Maggie for half an hour. This was the area for enjoying a morning coffee with a cigarette, which was all I ever saw Waza consume during our stay. We didn't last long due to our sleep deprivation the night before. Tucked in our warm sleeping bags, we slept like the dead. The next morning, Janine went to take a shower and returned laughing. There's plenty of privacy towards the path, but there's no wall behind the showers. It's wide open in the direction of Waza's hut. Really? Did you take a shower? Her hair was wet, but I wasn't sure if she got naked in those conditions. I did. His rain tarp is down. But you've got to wonder. We packed up and walked up to Waza's treehouse to say our goodbyes. The floors were highly polished wood, and the grain was beautiful. It was wild to see such a floor in an open tree hut. He had a single bed, big screen TV, a desk, and other comforts of home. He showed us some carvings of animals he had made, and I bought a platypus from him. It looked similar to mass-produced carvings I had seen around Australia, but I took him at his word when he said he carved it. Where you headed next? Waza asked. We're going to check out your neighbor's zip line through the fruitback colony, then Cape Hillsborough, Hook Island in the Witch Sundays, then Cairns to get some diving in off the Great Barrier Reef. Hook Island? He shook his head. That's stuck in the 50s. You don't want that. I shrugged. I would have to see it for myself. After we packed up our car, we drove a few miles to forest flying. A young couple owned the property where a water wheel built on a stream generated electricity to meet all their needs. Like Waza, they were very self-sufficient, including, it emerged, having personally built the zip line system through the fruitback colony that roosted on their farm. I asked the owner if he had a lot of zip line experience prior to doing this. Not really. I just read a lot of books and figured out how to install the proper safety features. I glanced back at Steve and smiled. This would be an adventure. To his credit, the owner had proper gear and gave us a safety lesson and practice run on a line that was six feet above the ground. Then we took a hike up to the highest point on his property to begin our tour of the bats. Unlike other zip lines I have been on, there were no dizzying drops, but what made the course fun was that it stayed inside the tree branches to give you close encounters with the leathery brown and black fruit bats. There were thousands of them. The bats were nocturnal, so they were sleeping, or trying to sleep, when we buzzed past them. Hanging upside down with their wings folded, they looked like two-foot-long alien seed pods. But they did not stay dormant for long. Our actions made them flap and squawk. They moved in herky-jerky mechanical motions. When they took flight, they became beautifully real. At the end of our run, we all agreed that this had been worth the side trip. After we said our goodbyes to the owners, we piled into our rental and headed north to Cape Hillsborough. On our journey, we passed several sugarcane plantations, and Steve marveled at the tractors pulling long trains of square metal carts filled with freshly cut cane. We arrived at Cape Hillsborough in the afternoon. I had some anxiety as we drove up to the hotel. I had struck out twice with my traveling companions, and I felt some pressure to make good with this booking. When we entered our third accommodation, we found it to be nice, quiet, and clean, with glass covering the windows. I breathed a sigh of relief. After we settled in, we took a walk southward on the beach. The tide was out, so the sand stretched on for miles. Along our way, we kept finding little balls of sand about half the size of a marble. The balls were always arranged around a small hole in the sand, and many had interesting patterns to admire. Some resembled sunbursts or flowers, others were more abstract. I decided to spend some time staring at one of these holes, and after a few minutes, I saw a tiny crab dart out, pushing one of these sand balls away from its hole. The crab placed the ball in line with others, adding to the grand pattern. I'm sure the crab was simply clearing pathways to food down below, but I was fascinated by the unique designs. 
the crabs were artists. The balls reminded me of the pointillist approach I saw in Aboriginal art. Perhaps a few thousand years ago, the crabs had inspired the humans. That night Steve wound up toilet-bound with a bad case of stomach cramps and diarrhea. Having had similar trouble in Ghana, Peru, and Morocco, I felt for him. I was thankful it was not I chained to the porcelain throne. One reason I had picked this area was I had read that kangaroos and wallabies came to the beach at dawn to eat. I planned to get up bright and early to see them. I set our alarm for one hour before sunrise, and we all awoke to the clock screeching. A midnight blue sky hung outside. Steve decided to join us even though he was still under the weather. The three of us hiked out onto the beach. A half hour before sunrise, the wallabies began crawling to the edge of the jungle to cautiously observe us. They kept their front paws on the sand and scooted on the backsides of their enormous hind legs. We froze. A few minutes later, one hopped a few feet onto the open beach and scouted the landscape. Then it hopped a few feet further. This must have been the signal to the rest, because suddenly several more hopped out from the half-mile stretch of jungle. A few minutes later, the gray kangaroos emerged. They were twice the size of the light brown wallabies. The grays also had longer heads, which helped us differentiate them. Just before dawn, there were roughly a dozen of each species hopping about. The sun cracked over the liquid horizon. An older man in a white baseball cap, shorts, blue shirt, and flip-flops strolled out from the direction of the hotel, carrying two ten-gallon buckets of what looked like cow feed, making soft clicking and whirring sounds. Within seconds of hearing his call, the kangaroos and wallabies gathered around him and followed him out to a large patch of open beach. He dropped piles of feed every five feet to create a great ring of cuddly critters. I dubbed him the kangaroo whisperer. A crowd of humans congregated outside the ring of marsupials. They're quite wild, the whisperer announced in his Australian accent. They only come out because they know I have food. He addressed one little girl. You can pet them, but be very gentle and approach slowly. Don't crowd them, because it scares them. Do they have any diseases? One Australian father asked. No, these roos are healthy. They leave the sick ones in the jungle. I always thought they were bigger, I observed. These are greys, he answered. The reds are as tall as a man. They live in open country. The greys are small, to maneuver in the jungles. A grey, resting on the foot-long tibia portion of its leg, was the same height as my elbow. If the kangaroo stood on its tiptoes, it would have been as tall as me. A red would tower over me, if I could get as close to one. Following the whisperer's instructions, we began to approach and pet. When I had visited Antarctica, my instructions had been not to touch anything. I would have been happy to get within a few feet of the marsupials. I had no inkling I'd be petting one. The gray's fur was as soft as a rabbit's. The wallaby fur was coarse. We stayed for almost two hours petting, observing, photographing, and enjoying the laughter of the small children who were also touching the animals. Eventually the sun was high in the sky and it was time to pack up and drive north. We reached Airly Beach by late afternoon and stayed the night at a place Steve had found. Nice work, Steve. Janine complimented him. Best place we've stayed at so far, I added. I meant it. The next morning, before we headed to the wharf to catch our ferry, Steve made a stop at a convenience store. I need to buy more chocolate. We'll be on Hook Island for two days. I'm running low, and there's so much to choose from in this country. Ever thought about becoming a fitness spokesman for Chocolate Abs World Tour? I smiled. I don't know how you do it. It's all about moderation, I snort laughed. An hour later, we boarded a swanky new pontoon ship called the Voyager that held about a hundred passengers. She carried tourists to various spots in the Witch Sunday Islands in the course of a day trip, but we were using her more as a water taxi. As we cruised out of the early harbor, we were greeted with a display from several humpback whales and their cabs. The ship's first stop was Hook Island. We disembarked with one other couple, but the majority of passengers stayed near the ship. They were taking the full tour and would be back at Early that afternoon. We would finish the circle after we had enjoyed this timeless hideaway for two days. When we discovered the Aboriginal tour would be impossible, Steve and I had searched for other adventures on the road less traveled. From our reading, we had pictured Hook Island as a resort that would be preserved in the time it was constructed. We were prepared to go back in time 50 years to a world of innocence before cell phones, the internet, or terrorism. We'd be living like members of the Rat Pack, drinking highballs and asking our cabana boy to adjust our sun umbrellas. One particular highlight was an underwater observatory that had been built, then sunk, 
off the shoreline like a portion of Strombold's ocean lair in The Spy Who Loved Me. We were sold on this image of Hook, and my companions were just as excited as I. It's a long way to the resort. You want to leave your bags at the pier, our photographer hostess from the Voyager instructed. Someone will be by to pick them up and take them to your rooms. We took a steep climb up a hill, then along a path through the jungle, and then down another steep trail to reach the resort. Many of the sidewalks were broken, and in some places they were just dirt and root-riddled paths. But if the lack of new paths and a few other amenities kept other people away, no problem. The trek ended at a large, single-story wood building painted white with blue trim. From the outside, I was reminded of a ranch-style motel. On the inside, the lobby had a floor-to-ceiling veneer of boulders. The space must have had more of a purpose when it was designed, but now it was a thousand square feet of open floor. Other than a few dining room chairs, there was no place to sit and no other furniture in the room. Past the lobby was another thousand square foot space with a concrete floor and steam tables. This was the dining area for breakfast and lunch, but it more closely resembled a grammar school cafeteria or YMCA mess hall. Beyond the dining area was a pathway leading to some bungalows in a large, unattached bunkhouse. Everything in the resort was faded, peeling, broken, well-worn, or simply not working. I could tell the maintenance fund had been drastically reduced over the past decade. Where are all the people? Janine asked. Probably out kayaking or exploring the island. I saw one couple sunbathing, but no cabanas or chase lounges were in sight. At least we don't have to fight for a spot on the beach, Steve smiled. Our room was in the bunkhouse. When we opened the door to our temporary home, our eyes fell upon a bare wooden floor with chips of paint and a thin, even layer of sand, and three wooden beds. The floor sagged from dry rot, and when I walked, my footsteps reverberated through the open crawl space beneath. Our room had the quality of a dilapidated backyard shed. I opened a flimsy door at the back of the room. Hey, there's a private bath. Janine peeled back an old bedspread. Sheets are sandy. I began to feel guilty about another bad booking. Well, the beach is literally one step out our front door. I can sort of understand. Sandy sheets are never acceptable, Steve corrected. But I'm looking forward to exploring. Me too, I said nervously. Let's hike the island and check out the underwater observatory. Then tomorrow we can get some kayaks and paddle around the island. Sounds good. Janine smiled and kissed me. I think it'll be fun. Steve was being a good sport about things too. We were all used to camping and roughing it. How about we check out the Aboriginal caves first? A knock at our door interrupted our conversation. I opened it to find Gilbert with our bags. Gilbert was a six-foot tanned Frenchman in his early fifties who seemed to have a cigarette permanently fixed to his lower lip. He was the resort's boat driver, porter, handyman, waiter, busboy, dishwasher, and pool cleaner. He did everything that needed to be done to keep the place running. After sorting out our luggage and sleeping arrangements, we all hiked back to the lobby to hire a boat to visit the aboriginal caves from Andrea, the resort manager. Andrea was short and heavyset and was as inactive as Gilbert was active. Or at least she was never to be found when you needed her. Gilbert piloted us to the caves in the resort's small open hulled boat. The views from the boat were gorgeous. The water went from deep blues to turquoise and dozens of jungle-covered islands rose out of the glassy water. There were more whales about. The area was a humpback nursery. Gilbert beached the boat at the Island National Park where the caves were and we hopped out. Concrete steps in much better shape than those at the resort led up into a dense jungle canopy. We followed the path for a hundred yards and wound up in a cave about the size of a two-car garage. The government had built a raised walkway inside to allow tourists to get within five feet of the cave paintings. The glyphs were a few thousand years old. Most were painted with red dye and depicted fish and fishing nets that reminded me of lacrosse sticks. Gilbert motored us back to Hook and we decided to explore. We navigated along the dirt and concrete path that laced the landscape. At one point, we reached the summit and discovered what had once been a lookout restaurant. The roof was partially collapsed and the timbers were rotten. This is cool, Steve noted as he took photographs. From the partially collapsed roof and broken window frames, we could look out on turquoise water. Half a dozen islands floated like dark green foam on the glassy Pacific. A jungle canopy filled the foreground. On the hike back down, we found another area on the island littered with dead generators and the bodies of several land rovers that at one time served as makeshift power plants. Further past this point, on an empty beach, there was an old dock half sunken into a marshy bay. 
Eventually, we navigated to the island's only active pier and strolled down to the underwater observatory. The structure was painted turquoise, but rust infected almost every nook and cranny. We entered the top level and walked around a large round room where sunlight spilled through an open roof hatch. A cardboard box sat on a folding chair just below the hatch with a sign that said, Please help us maintain the observation station. Aside from the folding chair, an empty glass display case was the only other piece of furniture on this level. A water-damaged visitor's book sat on top of the case. Not exactly Strombold's lair, I announced. No, but it's pretty cool in a ghostly sort of way. Steve opened the stiff, rippled, and crackling pages of their visitor's book. There were only a few entries, and they were now barely legible. As they were everywhere else here, time and the sea were erasing all evidence of humanity. You think it's safe to go down? Janine's voice echoed from the center of the room. She stood next to two tubes, each of which had a spiral staircase leading downward. Why not? I shot down the left tube. The room below was very dark. There were portholes on the circular outer wall spaced every two feet. Many of the windows had algae growing around the edges, and seagrass waved outside. We saw a few fish and some crustaceans, but not much else. Even the ocean around Hook seemed to be abandoned. Are you thinking about all that rust we saw above? Steve asked, as we stood in the dark, damp, underwater steel tube. Janine gave a nervous laugh, and we all decided to head back up the stairs. That night we ate on the dining patio. I ordered the Barramundi special with a mango chutney, and it was quite good. The food would prove to be the major highlight of our Hook Island stay. There were four other groups besides us, which made the patio feel a bit deserted. This was the only place to eat on Hook, so we knew the entire island was close to empty. I refrained from humming Hotel California. We slept with the sound of the surf in the background. The next morning, I went to the beach office to grab a kayak, but the sign said they didn't open until 9.30. On my return to our room, I asked Janine and Steve, Are you guys having fun here? Steve shrugged. It's relaxing not having anything to do. That's not exactly a ringing endorsement, I laughed. I like it. It's kind of like visiting a resort in Chernobyl, Steve smiled. Everything is in a state of abandonment and decay. It's fascinating. I'd be happy if we left and saw something else, but I'm also happy just vegging out for a while. Just call me Flo, Janine said, as in going along with it. You guys plan this. I'm just the interloper. All right, I said. As long as we get a good kayak run today, I'll be fine. When 9.30 rolled around, I returned to the front desk, and Andrea laid down the kayaking rules. You can't go out beyond the anchored boats or the snorkel section. You have to stay within the sight of the resort. This meant we couldn't go anywhere. I felt incredibly frustrated, but was willing to give it a try. We all paddled out, and I cruised around the outer markers like a panther trapped behind glass. The more I paddled, the angrier I got. If I could not go exploring around the islands, then there was no point in staying. We had seen everything the place had to offer. The ferry would arrive at 10.30 a.m. and depart at 11 a.m. Then we'd be stuck here for another 24 hours. Intolerable. I began to rehearse my speech to Steve. I knew he did not have a lot of money, and this vacation was costing him an arm and a leg. If we checked out now, we'd probably forfeit our second night's stay. I decided I would reimburse him to make it easier. I paddled over to Janine first. I'm not happy. I can tell. I want to leave and try to catch the next ferry out of here. Are you okay with that? Sure. Did you ask Steve? I wanted to cover you first. Like I said, I'm just along for the ride. You guys decide. I paddled across the bay to Steve. As I drew nearer, I could see the Voyager anchored off the landing platform. Passengers were lined up to explore the Hook Island Fish Observatory. Hey, Steve! I shouted. Steve turned and smiled. If I paid you back the cost of a night on Hook, would you leave? If you can get them to haul my bag, sure. I'll ask. With that, I paddled ashore and walked up to Gilbert, who was sitting on a concrete step enjoying a smoke. Do you think there is time to catch the ferry back? I asked. We have two days to get to Cairn, and I thought we'd get a head start. Gilbert blew out a cloud of smoke. If you are not on the manifest, you probably can't. But ask reception. Reception was an alias for Andrea. If there's time, can you take our bags? Gilbert took a drag and exhaled. If you can get on, no worries. I went to the lobby to find both Andrea and the stewardess from the Voyager miraculously present. Our passage arranged, I ran back to the room and found Steve and Janine. If you guys want to go, we need to pack in five minutes. 
They stared back at me, a little shell-shocked. Yes or no? Let me know right now. They both said okay and packed their bags, and then Janine left to pay our bill. I dragged our bags onto the sand, which Gilbert loaded into a Zodiac on the beach before puttering off to the Voyager. I hiked with Steve to the dock while Janine waited for Gilbert to return so she could tip him for hauling our luggage. Steve and I reached the ship. We hung out by the gangway, but did not board. The ship's stewardess came out. We need to go in five minutes. Everyone else is aboard. My fiancé is coming, I replied. The captain blew the horn, and I began to think we'd be spending another 24 hours here. Then Steve pointed to the hillside trail. There she is! The stewardess checked her watch and then nodded. We'll be okay. Janine came shooting down the dock. We all hopped on board. Janine panted and sweated. Thanks, honey, I rubbed her back. I think we'll be better off in the long run. Our next stop was Whitehaven Beach, famous for having one of the largest stretches of white sand anywhere in the world. We had 90 minutes to explore and enjoy ourselves. The three of us strolled on the white shoreline and splashed around in the warm turquoise water. Steve lay in the sand, which resembled powdered sugar in both color and consistency. As he lay on his back, he rubbed his hands in the fine dust and discovered it made a high squeaking sound. Smiling, he got onto his knees and began to whip his hands over the sand like a DJ. Steve had the White Haven dubstep down before dubstepping hit pop culture. Janine and I were in stitches. Our next stop was Daydream Island, the modern version of Hook. The entire island was a playground with tourist shops, a water park, a miniature golf course, an outdoor movie screen, and a block of hotels with modern amenities. It's funny, Steve observed. It has the same Twilight Zone creepiness of Hook Island, only it's clean, manicured, and new. Like the town of Stepford. I shrugged. It didn't seem that bad to me. I wonder what it'll look like 20 years from now. Once the ferry docked in the early port, we searched for a hotel and found a great deal on a hilltop flat overlooking the harbor at the Vista Apartments. It was by far the swankiest place we had stayed to date. The owner had charged the original no-show guests for the fully equipped two-bedroom, two-bath apartment and was happy to book us at half the price. In the morning, I woke up to a wild cockatoo eyeing us from his perch on our balcony. Since we had moved up our itinerary by a day, we'd have time to see Wallaman Falls, Australia's tallest waterfall. Before we left, we took one last walk on Early Beach. The most fascinating aspect of this place was the many swimming pools built just a hundred yards from the ocean. Upon closer inspection, we discovered why. Several emergency jellyfish sting stands had been built right by the water. Box jellies were a huge problem in the area. In order to enjoy the beach worry-free, the Aussies had installed swimming pools. On the way to Ingham, where Wallaman Falls lay, we made a quick photo stop in Bowen, home of the Big Mango. Sharing America's love of roadside tourist traps, many Australian towns have local attractions to get you to pull off the main highway and hopefully spend a little money. In Bowen, there was a 40-foot orange fiberglass mango. In Morani, they had the Tidy Town Award which was more about bragging rights for keeping their town and public places immaculate, as proclaimed by a four-foot-by-six-foot wooden sign in the middle of a grass median. There was no way to miss it. As we traveled north, we passed a very large roadkill. The color and size were a dead giveaway that this was a red kangaroo. I was disappointed that my first red encounter in the wild was with a deceased one. I felt bad for the kangaroo but now I realized why every truck on the road had massive guards over the bumper, grill, and headlights. It saved the trucks from a ruin counter and kept the driver alive. We reached Ingham in the afternoon and had a late lunch at a burger stand. In America, I'm used to seeing standard lettuce, onion, and tomato on a burger. At this particular spot, every burger had a thick beet slice covering the patty. The beet gave the burger a very earthy taste. Steve also made sure to stock up with three more candy bars and an ice cream. With our pit stop complete, we strolled down Lanarkoff Street, one of the main drags in town, where we checked in at Lee's Hotel. It had been built in the late 1930s and had housed quite a few local troops on their way to serve in World War II. Everything in the hotel was from its last renovation during the early 50s, but unlike Hook, it had all been maintained and well-preserved. Steve took a passionate interest, snapping photos of virtually everything in the building. The room itself was dated, but comfortable. We ate dinner in the hotel restaurant that night. It was a two-story hall with dark brown carpet, large red vinyl booths, and wood veneer tables. There were photos on the upper ceiling of cowboys. 
Three dirt-crusted and denim-clad patrons sat at the bar on the other end of the room. Two of the figures were men, and one was a woman. One man wore a red ball cap with a yellow kangaroo crossing sign on it. Kangaroo spoke with a slight Bushman accent. I don't think we should have sent our boys over. We've got enough troubles at home, and we've got no business fighting other people's wars. The other man spoke. I disagree. We need to do our part in Iraq, or Al-Qaeda will be here with one shake of a lamb's tail. The woman laughed with a gravelly voice. Listen to Archie, Ron. It's their problem. And if we really mean business, then Kevin Rudd just calls up Bush to respond with a nuke every time they try to hurt one of our own. Make them think twice before they try anything. Jeez, Nan, Ron replied. You've been in the sun a little too long. The woman threw back her drink and cackled. I'm just talking about one little nuke. You wipe out a city for each terrorist attack and everybody falls in line. PDQ. Saves our boys in the process. I grinned at Steve. Still wish you were listening to the Aborigine creation myth at Uluru? He smiled back. Nah, we've got a real Big Bang story right here. We groaned and laughed at Steve's pun. We all ordered steaks, which were pretty good. Afterwards, we crashed and got a good night's sleep. The next morning, we drove across town and checked in early at the Hotel Nurla, a turn-of-the-last-century plantation home that had been carefully restored into a hotel. The house was filled with wood from floor to ceiling and looked like something built in Africa during Europe's imperialist expansion. This was the second of Steve's bookings, and he scored major points for it. I turned to Steve and spoke in my best British accent. I say, old chap, you've done well for yourself since the Zulu campaigns. Steve didn't miss a beat with his South African response. You're mistaken, Barnaby. I fought in the Boer War. <laughs> Indeed. Must be the humidity inflating my goiter. Always puts my humors out of balance. Better have that checked. You don't want to fall victim to any off-color humor. Since our rooms were not ready, we stored our bags and drove out to Wallaman Falls, located in Giringan National Park. I was on a photographic quest to find a cassowary in the wild. The cassowary is the size and shape of an ostrich, but has a blue head and neck, a black beak, and a large, black bony crest on its head. It looks a bit like it's wearing an infantry hat from Napoleon's army. Cassowaries are shy and their numbers are falling, therefore sightings in the wild are rare. We parked at the trailhead and took the long, steep hike down into the Herbert River Valley. When we reached the base of the falls, Steve and I stripped down to our birthday suits and dove in, intending to swim out under the falls. Janine opted to sit this one out. The water was freezing, and as we swam closer to the turbulent liquid sailing down from 180 meters above, we decided that we were too old for this bleep. My legs began to cramp. We started to shiver. We got within five yards of the falls and decided to swim back. We dried off, got dressed, and tromped around the rocks surrounding the Wallaman Terminus before rejoining Janine, ready to head back. We arrived back in Ingham a few hours before sundown and opted to explore the newly created wildlife park that boasted wallabies, birds of all kinds, and crocodiles. The park was connected to the natural waterways in the area, so animals were free to come in and out as they pleased. When we arrived back at the hotel after nightfall, Janine and I went to our room. A minute later, Steve knocked on the door. You've got to see this. He led me back to his room, which overlooked the main drive onto the property. I made the mistake of leaving my window open when we left for the hike. When Steve opened his door and turned on the light, my eyes fell on a thousand small shiny green beetles. They were on his lamp, the bed, the walls, and the desk. Some flew into the air and around the lamp. I left the light on. I figure that's why they came in. At least you won't be alone tonight. I'll try turning out the light and standing outside the door with a flashlight. Photo tax has got them in. Maybe it will get them out. If not, call housekeeping. I'm not sure how long he had to stand out there, but he eventually lured them out. The next morning I was up at the crack of dawn. I strolled around the property and was amazed at the number of bird species there were. I saw Australian ibis, fruit doves, and a top-knot pigeon but the most amazing attraction was the flock of rainbow lorikeets that were using the hotel's bird bath as a rest stop. The birds were about as tall as my fully extended hand. Their plumage was brilliant green, orange, yellow, and purple. They were dazzling examples of tropical birds. I sat up on the balcony with my telephoto lens and spent a good hour photographing the lorikeets playing in the bath. They were a joy to watch. Our next stop was to be Cairns 
the third largest city on Australia after Sydney and Melbourne. Cairns, pronounced Cairns, is basically the Miami beach of Australia. The weather is balmy year-round, and it has the relaxed feel of that American city. However, the cityscape is very low-rise. I don't think there's a single building taller than five stories. It's also the national hub for scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef. I had already booked us passage on a dive boat so I could scuba dive and Janine and Steve could snorkel. On our way out to Cairns, we stopped in Tully, famous as Australia's wettest town. Their tourist attraction was a 25-foot-high boot with a frog climbing out of it that showed the town's annual rainfall of 12 feet. We stopped at the boot and discovered a stairwell inside that allowed you to climb to the top, from which vantage point Steve spotted a sign for a sugar refinery tour. His trip-long appreciation of sugar tractors had suddenly culminated in this moment. You guys want to go? He asked hopefully. Why not? Jeanine replied. I think it's our destiny, I added. The rail cars bringing in the sugar cane to the processors were identical to the ones we had seen all along our coastal trip. Every detail of the tour was fascinating, from seeing the cane getting crushed to the refiners, and finally the raw sugar that wound up in bags. The bags were packed in crates, then taken by train to a dock that was over a mile long and contained an enclosed conveyor belt system that loaded the sugar right onto freighters. We got access to pretty much every spot in the factory. It was more fun than anyone, even Steve, had expected. From Tully we made a straight shot to Cairns and arrived just after dark. We checked into our hotel, which felt more like a college dorm. This was another booking Steve had made, but he was still way ahead of me. After dropping off our bags, we explored the streets in search of food. Naturally, Steve zeroed in on a little store called Movenpick that served Swedish ice cream. Did I mention before that Steve is the most physically fit person I know? The next day, we headed out to the Great Barrier Reef. Steve and Janine went snorkeling together, and I went diving with the ship's dive master. The day was cloudy, so the intense colors I had hoped to see were subdued. Regardless, the ocean was teeming with life. We swam over giant clams, crabs, and starfish. At one point, a territorial triggerfish attacked us all. Once we were back aboard, our Australian dive master commented, She must have laid eggs nearby to be going after us like that. Anyone get nipped? Two of my fellow divers had received a bite, though nothing too serious. The fish reminded me of the Arctic terns on South Georgia Island. They'd dive bomb anyone and anything that came too close to their nest. The amount of life per square foot in the Great Barrier Reef was far greater than what I was used to seeing when I dove off the coast of California. I only wished that we had more days to explore it. Upon our return to Cairns, Janine and I decided it was time to have some local cuisine for dinner. We found a place called Ochre that served an Australian game platter to share consisting of kangaroo, emu, octopus, crocodile, and wild Australian grain. After the waiter described the platter to us, he added, we're the only country in the world that eats on national symbols. The crocodile was fishy and the emu was a bit tough. It had the peaty taste of something in the mammal family rather than a game bird. The kangaroo was my favorite by far, and I tried not to think of those cute greys we'd seen on the beach in Cape Hillsborough. The next day we were back in Sydney, sleeping in a Sheraton that was far nicer than the O'Malley's had been. The next morning, after breakfast, Janine and I said our goodbyes to Steve, who was flying back home to Los Angeles. Janine and I would catch a flight to Christchurch on New Zealand's South Island. I was happy with our trip. We loved Australia. We could have been expats there. On the whole, Australians reminded me of Texans. They had big personalities and had the rough rider feel of cowboys on the open plain. There had been plenty of surprises, even though the fantasy of a communal moment with ancient civilization did not come to pass. I did not experience the crack of Australia either. I did, however, experience a journey with two of my favorite people, and that in itself was satisfying for my soul. We enjoyed and respected the country and its people without forcing the trip into some preconceived ideal. I left with the hope of traveling more and of understanding people and their environments as a participant or an observer. Either way, I love the perspective I gained every time I stepped out of my own front door.